It has now been several days since the tragedy in Las Vegas. And it is a tragedy. It, it's horrific beyond belief. And incidentally, it does seem to be a new normal that I did not know of when I was growing up. The pontificating has begun on the news. The debate over various laws has begun on the news. But there is no law that can be made to stop evil from being evil. An evil person is going to do evil deeds. There are two primary purposes to a law. We'll use driving as a car as an example. So the first aspect of the law is very simple. It tells us how to get from point A to point B safely. Now, you can ignore the laws of the road. You can drive drunk. You can text and drive. You can do all manner of things with a car that is not prescribed by the law and do an untold amount of damage. And when you do that, then the law serves as a standard that you are then judged by. But what the law cannot do is force you to obey it. It tells you how to get from point A to point B safely. It then acts as a standard in which you are judged by when you choose not to obey the law, but it cannot and never has been able to insert morality or virtue into another human being. The things that transpired in Las Vegas, people are acting as though this is, this is, uh, uh, some kind of surprise. This is not a surprise. This is a logical outcome of years of work. We have sought to undermine the virtues that have held this country together for years. We have chipped away at the foundation stones of this country and those things that this country was built upon. When you chip away at foundation stones, it should not be a surprise that the house is going to start to collapse. This is not a mystery. It's a logical outcome. You know, Israel did this very kind of thing. They abandoned the God of their fathers, a God that their fathers did not know. And they chose to serve other gods, foreign gods. And then they scratched their head and wondered, why did this happen? You see, when we teach our children that it is okay to diminish the life of the most innocent person amongst us in our society, that is the unborn child, it should be no surprise that they're able to carry that forward and then diminish the life of other human beings. That's not a shock. It's a logical outcome. When we say that we are an evolutionary accident, 
Therefore, we have no higher moral uh, standard to be judged by that we can make up our own standard because after all, we're an accident anyhow. We are an evolutionary mistake therefore not ascribing any additional value to human life, it should be no surprise that as time goes by, people will find ways to rationalize behaving badly towards other human beings. When we say that there is no higher standard, then it should be no surprise that we are going to discard that higher standard. If we say mankind is a disease that has infested the planet, you see, we aren't ascribing any value to human life. We're a disease. What's the big deal if we are eradicated? That's what you do with the disease. Why should anybody be shocked that people are being eradicated? And what does it matter anyhow? We, we, we undermine life. We undermine our own value. We undermine the value of others. We even teach our children to undermine authority and law and the representation of virtue by having our children, by allowing, should I say, allowing our children to kill cops in a video game. And then when it happens for real, we act surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. Don't be so foolish. Let me show you something in Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is known as the Song of Moses. And it is the Song of Moses. God told Moses to write this down as a testimony against the people because God knew that the people would turn from them. If you would turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32... And I'm going to read it out of the ESV just a little bit. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But look at what it says here in verse 28. Verse 28. For they are a nation void of counsel. <laughs> and there is no understanding in them. If they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern their latter end. How could one have chased a thousand and have put and two have put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had given them up? You see, it was the Lord that has brought us victory. It is the Lord that has established this country. It is the Lord that infused virtue into its people. You see? But listen to this, 31. For their rock is not as our rock is, and our enemies are by themselves. For their vine comes from the vine of Sodom, uh, Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are the grapes of poison. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents, the cruel venom of asps. That's exactly what we're experiencing today. When you exchange the truth for a lie, when you put away Jehovah God in favor of foreign and false gods, this is exactly what you should expect. Look at this in, in verse, verse 36, what it says, For the Lord shall judge his people, and repent himself for his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods? 
let their rock, see, let their rock in whom they trusted, uh, which did eat the fat of their, their uh, sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering, let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See, God's, uh, God is being sarcastic. sarcastic. He's saying, let your gods, let your wisdom, let your understanding come to save you now. And the obvious answer is, it can't save you. There is no way that our wisdom, our righteousness, our philosophy that we have been espousing in our schools has the power to save us any more than a law has the power to instill into another person virtuous living. Laws only work for virtuous people. Look at what, what it says here in Proverbs chapter 14. It's only one verse, but it's applicable to today. Verse 34, or chapter 14, verse 34, it says this, The righteousness exalts a nation. But, this, but sin is a reproach to any people. You see, this country uh, had not experienced these kind of activities up for, for many years, except on very small scale. Now it's becoming a way of life. And everybody's asking on the news, what has happened? This kind of thing didn't happen before. Well, the reason being is because we no longer espouse righteousness. This is flat out common sense. When you don't espouse righteousness, when you do not espouse virtue within its people, when you undermine the underpinnings of this country, its foundations, there's no, there, this is the logical outcome. This is not a surprise. I don't know why people are so dumbfounded when this kind of thing happens. All right, this nation, even the non-Christian people, used to have a certain reverence, a fear, a respect for God, a reverence and a fear, a respect for the Bible, His Word, and for the church and for the pulpit, even if they themselves had not accepted Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. There was a general blanket of righteousness and virtue that was instilled into the people of this country. That has diminished to the point now that it is no longer even a thin veil that covers us anymore. You see, and as the church has retreated and has become more like the people that are outside the doors of the church, the light has also retreated. We cannot put ourselves under a bushel, speaking of us Christians now, and then wonder why the world has went to hell in a handbasket. We aren't engaging the, the, our, our society at large. We aren't standing for what's right and true. When somebody espouses at work, you know, uh, uh, ideas that are accepted within society, but not accepted by the Word of God, we kowtow to them we don't stand up for what's right. And as a matter of fact, if we do stand up for what's right, we're the ones that are portrayed as being the evil people, the hate mongers for standing for what's right and virtuous. This ought not to be. But as long as God's people are in retreat, the righteousness that blanketed this country is also going to contract and be in retreat. So there is one last thing that I would like to share with you real quick 
and that is this. It's found in Galatians. A lot of people are familiar with this, but the way it ends, we don't really pay attention to. The last couple words. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. But this is how it ends. It ends this way. It says, Against such there is no law. You see, there's no law necessary in heaven or on earth or under the earth for this type of behavior. But this is virtuous, you see. And when we are no longer a virtuous people, not even law can protect us. All law can do is serve as a standard in which we are measured and judged by, should you choose to reject that law. So, before I close, I'd like to encourage everybody to take a stand for righteousness. Don't be surprised when these things happen, especially when you yourself are not engaging your society. We, we shouldn't be surprised at all. Embrace righteousness. Embrace virtue. Embrace the Word of God within your life. Come back to your foundations. And the Lord can raise this country back up. But that won't happen as long as we continue to undermine it.